Thank you for that, Michael. Well, this is where we say good morning and welcome to our online viewers. We always miss you and we hope that you know that you are loved and you're missed and we look forward to uh, fellowshipping with you in person uh, soon. And so it's great that you can join us online for this time. Ruth's now going to come and read for us our Bible readings. Thanks, Ruth. morning. Our first reading is from Psalm 133. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. From there, our Gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one from whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and if he were cast into a sea, than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And now we come to Philemon, or Philemon, depending which side of the divide you sit. And I'm reading the whole chapter. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God for you always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is for us, for the sake of, the, of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man now, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in, became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, Sending you my very heart, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do ever more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace and Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.
Thank you, Ruth. Well, as we come to <clears throat> the passage, how about we open with prayer? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your goodness to us. We thank you for your word and that you speak to us through it. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to love you more and more. Amen. Irene and Janet don't get along. That's what you need to understand when you come to this church. That was the, one of the first opening lines that we got at one of the churches that we started at. We've now been at a number of churches, so I'm sure that it's kind of can't fully identify who that is. It wasn't this church, of course. Um, but this is what we heard. Irene and Janet don't get along. They sit on separate sides of the aisle. It was pews back in those days and one on each side. They didn't do things together. They didn't serve alongside each other. They didn't talk to each other. All of those things, it was pretty awkward and everyone knew about it. It was a bit of a problem though because their kids were friends with each other and they liked to do things together. So that was kind of a bit awkward. But it's sad, isn't it? I'm sure it's not just an Australian church problem. I'm sure that there's churches elsewhere in the world where the brokenness of fellowship between believers is all too common. It's a sad and terrible thing, isn't it? That people who know and love the Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, can be divided and separated and there can be a brokenness in the fellowship that's all too visible and awkwardly so. Well, today we are, we are I guess, finishing our Colossians series because Philemon kind of comes on the back of Colossians, but we're finishing our series with Philemon and we're going to see the brokenness of the fellowship. We're going to see the cost of restoring that fellowship and also the necessity of fellowship. And so let's get started with our first point, point number one, loving fellowship. And as Ruth read for us there in verse one, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphippa, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Philemon's a letter, surprisingly, written to Philemon. It's written by Paul to this guy, and it was a letter sent with the Colossians letter, with Tychicus and Onesimus. You know that Michael talked about that last week as we went through the ride at the end. But did you notice a slightly strange way that Paul starts his letter there in verse 1? Because in verse 1... Of Colossians, he starts by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. But how does he start here in Philemon? He says, Paul, a prisoner. Instead of making a big deal about his authority, Paul makes a big deal about his suffering and humiliation. Now, would you do that if you're writing to someone? Would you do that if you were going for a job? Hi, I'm Mike. I'm unemployed. I got fired from my last job because I was useless. Well, we're so glad that you graced us with your presence in this interview. Would you say that, hi, I'm Mike, I got rejected and humiliated and I have no friends? Or, hey, I'm Mike and here's the most embarrassing, silliest thing that I've done in my life and here it is. Now, you probably wouldn't do that, would you? And so why does Paul draw attention to something very embarrassing and shameful in his day and age? Well, I suggest it's because he wants to set the tone for the letter. It's a different tone than the Colossians letter. He's setting a tone of humility because he's going to deal with some pretty big stuff. All right, so who's Philemon? Well, we're told that he's a dear friend and fellow worker in the gospel. He's someone who is very special to Paul and they've worked together side by side, no doubt, for many, many years. But it's not just to Philemon the letter's written to. It's written to Aphippa, possibly Philemon's wife, and to Archippus, possibly Philemon's son. But it's not too important, really. And so Paul's writing a deeply personal letter to a guy called Philemon, a good gospel friend, a valued, trusted co-worker. But did you notice something weird as well at the end of verse 2? It's a deeply personal letter, and Paul will raise some big issues, some sensitive, difficult stuff for Philemon to deal with, but it's delivered to the whole church to be read in front of everybody. Can you imagine that? We don't usually do that, do we? Well, at least I would imagine sensitive pastors probably don't usually do that. You could imagine, couldn't it? I get up here and go, Max, I've got a partial issue about you that I need to deal with. And Lex, I've written a letter, but don't worry, I'll read it out in front of the whole church. Now, I don't have an issue for Max. <laughs> 
No, not at all. Um, but we probably wouldn't do that, would we? No. So why would he do that? Well, I think it's got to do because of the material it is, and we'll see as we go. Well, we do see Paul's deep affection for Philemon, again on display in verse 4, don't we? He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. It's another reminder, isn't it, of the importance of regular prayer for one another. It's a precious thing to be prayed for, to be upheld and carried by the prayers of the saints, of brothers and sisters in Christ. It's all too easy to get busy in our life, isn't it? The great joy of being here at our church is that we are a prayerful church. There is regular prayer and people really do prayerfully care for one another. We need to remember one another in our prayers. Yes, we need to remember one another in the boring, normal prayers that stay the same for months on end. It is still good to pray those things, even if the prayer points don't change. And we need to pray for one another in the ups and downs of life. Let us not underestimate the power of prayer. And did you notice what Paul gives thanks for? He gives thanks for Philemon's love and faith. No doubt Paul has been praying for Philemon for a really long time that, and that God would graciously work in his life and God's answered that prayer. And so Paul is thankful for Philemon's progress in the faith. It's a great joy, isn't it? When God gives you the, the mercy and the grace to see how he works in people's lives. One of the great joys of getting older is to see others grow in their faith, let alone your own. I know, sisters and brothers, that there are many to give thanks for in their faith and growth. Who do you give thanks for? I give thanks for some of the, the guys I had in youth group when I first came to Ashbury. There were, you know, 11, 10, 12, and, you know, through many years and many prayers and much patience, it was great to see people like Will and Kate grow in their knowledge and love of Jesus. People like Aidan, who is now married and working a job and serving in his church. At another church, it's been great to see Alan, who we met, who's now going through some tough times, but is still holding firm to the faith in the Lord Jesus. Who are the people you are thankful for and their growth and faith in the Lord Jesus? Isn't it a, a wonderful joy to see people grow in Jesus and to know that there's no age barrier, is there? You don't just sort of reach retirement age and just sort of cruise into glory. It's what Paul gives thanks for in verse 7 is Philemon's love. Philemon's love has refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Do you know people like that? Brothers and sisters, I want to be someone who refreshes the hearts of the saints in the Lord. That's what I want to be. And I'm sure you have brothers and sisters who are dear to you who refresh you. Well, Paul then prays for Philemon that his partnership in the faith may be effective in verse 6. Partnership in the faith that has the idea of fellowship. When my parents were young, youth group was called fellowship. And they still keep talking about fellowship back in the 70s. No one knows what they're talking about who's under 40. But, you know, the idea of fellowship now is the idea of sharing in common good. And in our case, sharing in the commonness of Jesus. When you become a Christian and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you put your trust in Jesus, you're saved into a family. A fellowship of faith. Which means that if you're a believer, you automatically have a close and intimate fellowship with other Christians. You have a relationship. That brings great benefits and great responsibilities. But what does an effective partnership or fellowship actually mean? What does it look like to actually be church together? Well, it means growing deeper in our knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus and God's will for us. We saw that in Colossians, didn't we? Effective fellowship looks like us drawing closer together by putting off the old self. And putting on the new, surrounded by love, we saw in Colossians 3. But of course, there's a threat to the Colossians fellowship, isn't there? A threat even to our fellowship. Which brings us to our second point, point number two, fractured fellowship. There in verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul now moves to the issue he wants to address with Philemon. Remember, this is a deeply personal and pastoral and difficult issue, and the whole church is listening as they read Paul's email, I guess. Notice again how Paul starts his approach to the issue in verses 8 and 9. 
Paul could pull on his official authority. He could whip out his apostle badge, pull out all of his theological degrees, pull out the collar and say, look, hey, I'm the boss here. I'm the minister. You know, this is how it works. You've got to listen to me. This is what's going to happen. He could order Philemon to do something. Now, there's nothing wrong with Paul doing that, and he does that from time to time, doesn't he? He says very clearly, do this, don't do that. And that's right at times and for leaders to do that. There is a time where you need to pull rank on someone. But instead, in this case, what does Paul do? Instead of coming over, he comes alongside, doesn't he? He comes alongside Philemon and appeals on the basis of love, not authority. A reminder in verse 5 and 7 that Philemon's a man grounded in the love of God and he's a man who loves others as well. It's a reminder that Paul's a fellow brother, an old man in prison. He isn't lording it over Philemon as some distant authority, but coming alongside as a brother. And in verse 14, we hear that Paul tells Philemon that he doesn't want to force his hand. Instead, he wants Philemon to do what he ought to do voluntarily. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between getting someone to do something only because they have to do it, isn't it? And there's a difference between them doing it because they want to. If you've had children or you've interacted with anyone in the world, you know what the difference is, don't you? Obedience and voluntary doing it. Paul's appealing to Philemon's heart. Paul is testing Philemon's love and his preparedness to make fellowship work because it doesn't just happen, does it? And so what's Paul's appeal? Well, it's there in verse 10. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. As great as our Christian fellowship in Christ is, it's not always perfect, is it? If you found the perfect church, then leave because you'll ruin it. We live in a sinful, broken world where we hurt and are hurt by others. You don't have to live long in this life to know that. Often we are hurt in small ways. But sometimes we are hurt in really big and painful ways, aren't we? It's one thing to have fellowship with other believers when we like them, when they're nice to us, when things are going well. It's one thing to have fellowship with one another on a Sunday to say, hi, how's your week? And then don't see you again for another week or two. But that's usually fellowship from a distance, isn't it? It's usually superficial fellowship. But true, authentic and deep fellowship means sharing our lives together. Which means rubbing up against each other. Which means, yes, there are different personalities different ways of doing things. People are different. And the more you rub up against one another, the more likely you are to get a bit of friction, to be a bit difficult. But true fellowship works through difficult situations, doesn't it? it rather than skirting around them, it works through them and does the hard yards. Of course, only Christ can bring about and sustain fellowship through difficult situations. We can't do it in our own strength. Now, a difficult situation has arisen between Philemon and Onesimus, as you would have heard as Ruth read for us. But who was Onesimus? Well, first up, we learn that Onesimus is a new believer. He's been converted to Christ under Paul, and Paul wants Philemon to know straight up that Onesimus is a fellow brother in Christ. He's born again. Praise the Lord. He's gone from death to life. Angels have rejoiced in heaven. There is nothing better than this. But verse 11 hints at a problem. Because Onesimus used to be useless to Philemon. Onesimus was Philemon's slave. And it seems like he was a pretty useless slave. Probably not the most productive guy on the chain. Not only that, but he was a slave who had run away. Not only that, but he probably stole from Philemon and nicked some stuff along the way. So things aren't so great. But after his conversion, Onesimus has gone from useless to useful to Paul. Because the gospel has radically changed Onesimus. And maybe you know what this is like, don't you? How the gospel changes I've known and ministered to guys and women who have been enslaved to drugs and alcohol and gambling. 
But as they've come to Christ and their life has come unto him and brothers and sisters have gathered around them and helped them, they've totally transformed. Do they still struggle? Yes. But are they different? Absolutely. We've had a woman in our, one of our churches in the past where she got saved and realized how good Jesus was and realized that Jesus' way was the best way to live. And so she stopped sleeping with her boyfriend and stopped living with him. They eventually got married and she's still loving the Lord. Praise that. Friends, how have you been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you meet him, you can't help but be transformed. And it seems like Onesimus has been transformed by Jesus and he's become very dear to Paul in verses 12, 13 and 16. And so can we see how difficult this situation is, can't we? Onesimus has been a useless worker. He's run away from his master and he's stolen from him. So that is a terribly fractured relationship. Could you imagine working with someone like that or having a family member like that? But Onesimus has now become a Christian which means Philemon's now related to Onesimus as a fellow brother, not just as a, a boss, employee, slave, master relationship. They're related together. But there's this fracturing of the relationship because of the past. And here's the thing. Philemon can't just bury his head in the sand and go, oh, well, you know, I can just ignore it because Onesimus is at the church down the road and everything's happy there, but I don't have to see him, you know, and my internet connection is not so great, so I can't really Zoom him or Skype him or Teams him or whatever you want to do in this blessed world of ours because it hasn't been invented yet. And so I just can ignore Philemon and go, difficult situation, off to the side, sort it out in glory with Jesus, fantastic, because here's what Paul's doing. Paul's sending him back to Philemon back to the church because really there really was only one church in that city at the time and uh, in fact as the letter's being read and as Colossians was being read Philemon's probably right there sorry Onesimus is right there because he came with Tychicus to read it and Philemon's right there and so you can imagine one guy's here one guy's there and that's probably why the whole letter's being read to go hey guys let's sort this out and this is what's going down Imagine if we did that. I imagine that would be a pretty awkward church service, don't you? But we still haven't heard yet what Paul wants Philemon to do exactly, which brings us to our third point, point number three, restoring fellowship, verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Paul wants Philemon to welcome Onesimus back into the fellowship, back into church, but not in any old way. It's not like Philemon's supposed to be on welcoming that week and Onesimus comes in and Philemon goes, welcome to church. Here's our scroll handout of the hymns we're singing. We are reconciled. See you next year. It's nothing like that. In fact, you would never get that welcome at West Hamilton. Instead, Paul, appe no, I'm serious. Uh, Paul appeals to his deep and warm relationship, doesn't he, in verse 17? Philemon, if you consider me a dear friend, if you consider me a partner in the gospel, if our fellowship is grounded in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for us and his blood shed on the cross, if that is how close we are, then welcome Onesimus as you have welcomed me. I want you to imagine another believer who you know, someone who's very dear to you, maybe someone you've been through the trenches with over many years, through the gospel, through the ups and downs in life. You know that person, don't you? You welcome that person with overflowing joy, don't you? Your heart is encouraged, a big embrace, whatever it is, that person is special. Now think of another believer, a believer who's hurt you, a believer who's betrayed you, a believer who's been a constant source of frustration and disappointment. Two believers. Paul says, you are to welcome that one in the same way as you welcome this one. It would be hard, wouldn't it? To show such love and grace and fellowship and joy. It would be costly to restore such a fellowship, wouldn't it? And maybe you've known this cost before. 
Now we're starting to understand just how big Paul's task is for Philemon, aren't we? It was radical in Paul's day. There's the issue, of course, of the master-slave relationship, which is just, why would you even relate to someone below you? There's the issue of him running away, stealing and being useless. And it's just as radical in our day, isn't it? Our society struggles with forgiveness. As one person calls it, we live in a culture stripped of grace. If someone wrongs you, you cut them off, don't you? You're done with them. You don't need that toxicity and poison in your life. Move on. Life's too short. Only surround yourself with champions and yes people and people who are awesome. Is that really what our society needs? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You know, Mike, Paul is asking too much. Where's the justice? You don't know my story and the pain. Anesimus has caused great pain and cost to Philemon. Yes, they're fellow brothers in Christ, but damage has been done. And Paul anticipates this in verses 18 and 19. Paul acknowledges the cost to Philemon. He's been robbed of a slave and he's been robbed of possessions. Did you notice that Paul doesn't sweep it under the carpet? He doesn't say, you know, you know, Philemon, you kind of misinterpreted what happened. He didn't really, he wasn't really useless. He was just being efficient in his energy use when he was working for you. You know, he, he didn't really run away. He, he, he went away to discover himself and to, to fully realize his potential with another master or whatever mumbo jumbo that they had back then. Paul doesn't minimize the damage or hurt, does he? He doesn't say, you know, Philemon, you're pretty rich. You know, what's a couple of extra bucks? What's an extra slave gone? You know, it's not that big a deal. Get over it. Stop being so sensitive and emotional. Just move on. He doesn't, does he? Instead, Paul names it. He names the wrong and he offers more so to pay the debt for Onesimus. Paul says, whatever he owes, whatever damage he's done, let me know and I'll make a direct deposit. Let me know, I'll write the check. Let me know and I'll bring the cash, God willing, when I visit. I will pick up the tab for the damage done. Now that's radical, isn't it? That's countercultural. Who does that? How can someone even think of paying someone else's debt? I'm sure Paul had his own cost of prison living problems as well, don't you think? It's pretty, times are tough when you're in prison. Probably not a lot of extra cash going around. So why would Paul even offer to pay his debt? How can anyone offer to pay a debt to someone else? Well, the only way we can pay and offer to pay someone else's debt is because we've been captured by the love of Christ, the one who has paid our debt for us. The love that has sent Christ to the cross for us. Remember Colossians 2, 13 to 14? The letters come together, right? Jesus forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Those who have been forgiven much, love much. Those whose debt has been paid can freely pay the debt of others. Brothers and sisters, Christ brings us together initially as brothers and sisters, doesn't he? But Christ also keeps us together and allows us to come back together when our fellowship is fractured. Is it hard? Yes. Is it costly? Yes. Is it actually possible in our day and age to have such a radical love to restore fellowship? Yes. In many cases, yes. Even in difficult, hard and painful circumstances, yes. And so what does it actually look like to restore fellowship with one another when things go bad? And I'm thinking just particularly if you've been wronged, not the wronger. Firstly, it usually takes time, doesn't it? If someone has hurt you and it's been really bad and painful, it takes time to process that. And so we don't always have to rush in to restoring. Secondly, we need to acknowledge the wrong that is done. 
God has a passion for justice. He doesn't sweep it under the carpet. We should too. We should not be afraid to tell the truth about what has happened, what others have done to us, how we felt when they said or did that, when they used their tongue to cut us down. It is a good thing to name evil and hurt for what it is. And we can do that in a respectful, loving way without being vindictive. We need to acknowledge the wrong we have done and repent if we've done stuff wrong. We need to talk to God. Max the other week reminded us of the Psalms and how they give us words and prayers and songs to sing to God when the pain is too much and we can't find the words. When we're so angry, we can't find the words. God has given us his songbook. He's given us his prayer book. And when we pray for them, sorry, we should pray for them as well. And I find that really helpful. When people annoy me or when they've done stuff against me, it really helps to pray for them because it softens my heart against them. And it needs to be not the prayer of like the Pharisee of, you know, dear Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that hurtful, betraying Bobby Jojo who's so annoying and so painful and I'm so good to be able to try and even think about forgiving them. Of course, we need to look to the cross, don't we? We need to look to the cross where the God of the universe sends his son to live and die for us and rise again. Because as we stand in the shadow of the cross, how can we not forgive We need to explore our contribution to the wrong, not in all cases. But in most cases, it's not 100% their problem, is it? Even if it's 1% our problem, Jesus tells us to look at the speck in our own eye before, or the log in our own eye before the speck in the others. Maybe we need to move towards them in apology and seeking forgiveness too. Also, we need to remember that justice now is limited. If you have been wronged and hurt, then yes, there will not be full healing here and now. If you've been wrong and hurt and you need to go to the legal system, which is a good thing at times, then no judge can give you full justice. We need to remember that forgiveness and and restoration looks forward. We look forward to the new creation where there will be a perfect and indestructible world of love, where we will be fully healed, We live in the now not yet tension and only when Christ returns will forgiveness be fully complete, only will we be fully healed. And as we look forward to what Jesus will do for us and looking back at what he has done for us, then we will do the hard work of trying to restore our fellowship together. And we can only do it by the power of the Spirit. So let us continue this difficult task because it's worth it because our brothers and sisters in Christ are precious our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.